by John, the beloved disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, in, our, in, the, in the 90s, it is the revelation, not revelations as, as you can see in the name, revelation of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, which God gave to him to give to and John wrote, even as uh, he was called upon to do. This is one book that summarizes itself. You know, Bible scholars uh, um, make up the various summaries of, of various books of the Bible, but, but here, Revelation summarizes itself in one verse, chapter 1 and verse 19. He's told to write the things which you have seen, and that is chapter one, um, his vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. The things which are, and that is what we read in chapters two and three, the letters to the seven churches, and the things which shall be hereafter, um, chapters four to 22. The question might be asked, or might, yes, some people might ask, why those seven churches? There were several other churches that existed during the first century. There was the, the Roman church, the Galatian church, the Colossian church, the church in Jerusalem, and, and, and several other places. But as some would say to us, these seven churches basically put together, um, speak to and of the churches that presently exist. Something about each of these churches can be identified in the present day churches. Hence the reason this word given for, for these churches being the ones addressed. We made mention of a millennial, three millennial, post millennial. A millennial is the teaching that there is no real millennium, that the Lord Jesus Christ actually started reign after he died and rose again. And he's presently reigning through his people um, here on earth, having set up his kingdom in heaven. He's seated on the throne in heaven and reigning on earth through his people, the Christians. So the millennialists don't believe that there is a practical 1,000-year period to come. The post-millennial people are the ones who believe that this is, in fact, the millennium after which um, he will come um, for a people that's mostly his people, right? So we're talking about um, the whole earth as it were being converted unto Christ. So when he comes, you'll find that most people are in fact followers of him. And, and when he comes then, it will be um, to judge. So they call themselves the post-millennialists, or people call them that. Then we talk about the pre-millennials, um, to which group we belong, because we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, before he sets up his kingdom on earth, will come for his people in the rapture, as recorded in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, and again 1 Corinthians 15. So we believe that he will come in the rapture before the millennium. We believe that there's a literal 1,000 year period in which Christ will reign. The promise made to Mary by the angel Gabriel when the angel appeared to her there in Luke chapter 1 said, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Um, and this is the period that is being spoken of. We don't know of him sitting on any throne right now um, as it relates to David. But when he sets up his millennial kingdom, um, he was sitting on the throne 
of the Vera. Good. So that's pretty much what we did. I looked at last week. We also looked at the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was referred to as uh, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. We saw him being referred to like this. We also find that in Isaiah, God is referred to as the first and the last. So we have three such references in Isaiah of God being the first and the last. We have four such references in Revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ being the first and the last. So essentially, what we have before us is clear that Jesus the Christ is, in fact, equal with God the Father, as the Lord Jesus Christ himself said in John 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. This is what um, caused the Jews to crucify him, to say that he was blaspheming. If you read through John, for example, you'll find that on several occasions, they took up stones to stone him. In chapter 10, when, when he asked, why do you want to stone me? They said, for a good work, we stone you not, but for blasphemy. And because that you being a man, make yourself equal with God. In John 8 again, when he said, before Abraham was, I am, they again took up stones to stone him. Because they were of the opinion, quite rightly so, that he was claiming equality with God. You can read the same in Philippians chapter 2. Who being in the form of man thought in a robbery to be equal with God. So all of this that we read about him being referred to and referring to himself as the beginning and the end, we need as individuals to um, not only um, see it as being written, but accept it as fact that Christ is essentially God. So we have the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that's pretty much as much as we did last week. The last week's lesson, basically on YouTube, and you can access same um, if, you, if you need it, then let me, you can always send me an email or a WhatsApp and I will send same to you so you can review it um, at your own leisure. Now we move on from where we left off last week. As a matter of fact, for the sake of connection, I'm going to suggest that I may position myself better. Yeah. But for the sake of connection, we are just going to read the entire chapter. We were asked to do it during the course of the week. I don't know how many of us have done it, but I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody asking who read it. So I will spare you the embarrassment if you didn't read it. And so we'll read through. For the sake of time, I'll do the reading. Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who be a record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John 
to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him who was, who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the pups with a golden girdle. His head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp twedged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven churches, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Amen. Last week we made mention of I'm the Lord Jesus Christ being Alpha and Omega the first and the last, and we referenced um, Isaiah, where he, the Almighty God, is referred to as the first and the last. Interestingly, if you are, or should be at any time in an argument with a JW, um, those who call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, they will puzzle over this. They will readily recognize that the Isaiah passage is talking about Jehovah. But they refuse to admit that the Revelation passage, especially verse 8 of chapter 2, where we read, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, who was dead and is alive. They cannot um, wrap their their heads around this statement. Be that as it may, um, for your information, for our information, when we read Alpha and Omega, 
we all know or should know that those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha, A, Omega, not Z, but Omega, O. So the Greek alphabet, um, the Alpha and Omega would be what we would call A and O. But that O, unlike our O, the O in the Greek alphabet is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Likewise, it is the la Aleph and Ta of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, the first letter, they are mixed set up. And Ta, no, that Ta is the equivalent of our T. But although, again, T is not our last letter in the alphabet. It is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So when we read, therefore, Alpha and Omega, it equals the Hebrew Aleph and Ta, and in our English, um, A and Z. All right? So um, let us just um, get that clear um, in our minds. Right? The beginning and the end. That, that is the key factor. These letters are speak the beginning and the end. Okay, so we move on. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, said the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called the Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, John was banished to the isle of Patmos because of the word of God, because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now we can remember uh, having read Acts, and even before we read Acts, towards the end of the um, Gospels, how the disciples were hiding away from the Jewish authority. But when they saw Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection, then they began to be bold in declaring him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. After the stars, we read how that from time to time they were beaten and put in jail. For example, this first started in chapter 4, after the healing of the man at the beautiful gate of the temple. Um, Peter and John were arrested and warned not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ again. And we should be encouraged by what Peter and John said to them in Acts chapter 4 and verse 19 and 20. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, do judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That was their stand from then. And they were persecuted for this. For this. As a matter of fact, secular history would have us to know that most of these guys um, did not die natural death, apart from probably John and one or two others. Most of them were slain because of the gospel of Christ. We're reading, for example, Acts chapter 12, or James, the brother of this John, was killed by Herod. Peter was arrested and he should have suffered the same fate. But God miraculously, through an angel, delivered Peter from prison. You can read that in Acts chapter 12. Um, the legend has it that John was put to boil in oil and, and, and he just wouldn't boil. And so they took him out and banished him 
to the Isle of Patmos. I think the emperor at the time was a guy named Dalmatian. Um, who at the, after he died, then John was again released, where he lived out the rest of his life in uh, Ephesus. But that <clears throat> is basically as it relates to, to secular history, um, the end of, of John. But he was in, in banished to Patmos um, because of his stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Something that as individuals, we need to consider, would we be willing to, to be banished from our land, from our loved ones? Would we be willing to suffer persecution for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's a question that as individuals, we really should be asking ourselves. John and the other apostles were not afraid to stand up for Christ. So after being banished to the Isle of Patmos for the, because of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God, he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Who can, anybody can answer this one. And if you're going to answer, you can unmute your mic. The question is, which day was John referring to when he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day? Anybody? Sunday. 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 Everybody agrees Sunday? Is there anybody who, who disagrees? Is the day of the Lord Sunday? And I, I'm hearing a, a, a deafening silence. Nobody else is pushing out their neck. <laughs> All right. Um, Sunday could well be the day. It's just that scripture, there, nowhere in scripture, that describes Sunday as the Lord's day. It, it wouldn't be, be, be Saturday or the Sabbath day either. Because on each occasion that the Sabbath is mentioned, you find that it, it, it is said on the Sabbath day. You never heard the Sabbath day being referred to as the Lord's day. One Bible scholar at least believes that the Lord's Day referred here is actually what in other parts of the scripture is referred to the day of the Lord. In other words, this particular scholar believes that John was, as it were, transported in spirit to that day that will come, the Lord's Day. And so he prefers to see this as that day to come, um, which is what John was referring to. Um, but of course, um, that's opinion, and those who refer to it as in fact Sunday, that's, that's opinion. Um, we cannot um, be dogmatic and say it was in fact Sunday. All right? Just uh, thought I'd put that out so that we are on the same page. Um, Sunday was not given the title Lord's Day until sometime after, some, other, some centuries after the first century. But not in scripture is it ever, ever referred to as the Lord's Day. It's referred to as the first day of the week. We have grown to understand it and to adapt it as being the Lord's day. All right? Okay, so let's move on. Any question? Anything anybody wants to say? Please say no. All right. So then, verse 11. He said it in verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega. He's saying it again. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou sayest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Um, 
Now, each of these churches have some unique distinction about them. I'll tell you something now, and you are going to, as individuals, research it. Two of the churches written to, nothing good was said about them. There was no good commendation for, for those two churches. Two of them, there was nothing bad that was said about them. So two had bad reports, two had good reports. And then the other three, they had a mixture of good and bad. Question to you is, which is which? Which two are the ones receiving the good report? Which two are the ones receiving the bad reports? And which three um, basically have good and bad said about it? You read that in chapters two and three. And for next week, God willing, I'm asking us all to read through these chapters and make any notes that we want to make concerning these. So when John heard this voice, he says, I turned to see the voice. Of course, we know he really means, I turned to see the person to whom that voice belonged. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the pot with a golden girdle. So he saw seven golden candlesticks. When he turned, he heard <clears throat> the voice. And to that voice, like that of many waters. Over in Isaiah, we read that God spoke to Isaiah, or rather Elijah, the prophet Elijah. Um, not through the thunder, not through the, the storm, not through the wind, but in a still, small voice. Well, here we find him speaking um, with a voice um, which was like many waters. Verse 15 tells us that. But notice how he is described. So that's uh, seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. And girt about it the breast with a golden girdle. Now if you read the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel, you'll find reference to the son of man. Son of man, son of man. Daniel said, I saw one like the son of man. Um, this is a, a notation of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, when you read the Gospels, in particular Luke, you'll find that he refers to himself as a son of man. All right? So um, this is basically what John is saying. He recognized him to be the son of man. His head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow. And this speaks to his purity. Um, those of you who live in countries that experience snow from time to time will understand um, what it means um, when we talk about the purity of the snow. Because um, because Snow is basically white, pure white, okay? White as wool. And this speaks to, to his person, um, his purity, right? His feet were, 
for like like bronze, brass which has gone to fire. Now there's something that we need to understand about bronze or brass as we read in scriptures. Um, if you read through and Leviticus, you'll find much reference being made to bronze or, or the brass altar or the brazen altar. When we talk about bronze, we're talking about judgment. Right? We talk about judgment. When we talk about brass or bronze in scripture, that speaks to judgment. Just like silver speaks to redemption, bronze or brass speaks to judgment. We can well understand, therefore, when Moses was told in Numbers to make a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole, so that those who look up on it, um, whoever were bitten by the snake, they would be healed. Um, this bronze serpent spoke to and about the, 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 the one who would be judged for our sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself made reference to it in St. John chapter 3, where he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Outside of this, it is it cannot be it would not be understood um, the significance of a bronze serpent. Because normally we didn't talk about serpent, we say serpent represents the devil, serpent represents sin. But it's when you, you see, read what Jesus said in John 3, and when you read again in Second Corinthians chapter 5, that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, was made sin for us. He took on the farm, right? So that he could be punished. So that he could be the judgment for your sin and mine. So, um, significantly, therefore, when we talk about God, we're talking about judgment. The feet of the Lord Jesus Christ um, was like bronze, that which passed through the fiery judgment of God against um, sin in his body there on Calvary. Moving on, his head was, and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Not that it was a flame of fire, but like a flame of fire. And a lot of similes and metaphors are used in this book. And very important that we understand what are similes, what are metaphors. Lots of um, um, these, the, these occurrences um, here. In, in Revelation. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. Now, those of us who have had the privilege to visit like Dunn's River Fall or Niagara Falls or some other falls will um, testify to the, um, the noise that comes from those rushing waters as they come cascading down um, the, the falls. Well, this is what John was saying. His voice was like many water, not like a, 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 a rippling stream um, flowing by, but like many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Note well another metaphor. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. 
in First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, we read, The word of God is quick, that is life-giving, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So then, let us not think that an actual two-edged sword was coming out of his mouth, but his words are like a sharp two-edged sword, cutting through. And you and I know that there are occasions when we, as individuals, might say to somebody else, or somebody else might say to us, and what they say to us cuts like, like a machete, cuts deep, where the word of our Lord Jesus Christ cuts through, dividing even between soul and spirit. We're asked today to, to define or to, to state the difference between the soul and the spirit. And the truth is, we cannot definitively define or distinguish between soul and spirit. What is soul? What is spirit? And the, 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 the definition varies from person to person. But the word of God can make that sharp distinction between soul and spirit between joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So out of his mouth, him, his word, which is like a sharp two-edged sword, his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now, those of us who are familiar with the transfiguration, that we read of in, in Matthew chapter 17. We'll see that when the disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were on that mountain of transfiguration, when they saw his countenance there, as he stood up with Moses and Elijah, they say um, his countenance was bright, as it were, like the noonday sun. When Paul met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, as he described that encounter in chapter 22 and or chapter 26 of Acts, he says that his brightness was above the brightness of the noonday sun. And so this is what John was seeing there on the Isle of Patmos as he looked on the Lord in his resplendent glory, right? Um, as the sun shineth in his strength. That is, as the sun shining when it is brightest. And we know that the, the midday sun is the brightest. And none of us dare look directly at it because we will be blinded. Right? Now, John is saying his countenance was like the noonday sun. Obviously, therefore, um, he would have to, to fall down before him. Eh? And this is exactly what he did. Verse 17 When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. And you have the term again, I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. John fell at his feet as if he was dead. But the Lord said, fear not. I am the first. I am the last. So then, his reference to being the beginning and the ending or the first and the last appears three times in this chapter alone. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. 
And now again, in verse 17, I am the first and the last. But he didn't stop there. I, he said, I am he who liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So here, not only is he saying, I am the first and the last. I am the alpha and the omega. I am the beginning and the ending. But he's also saying, saying I am he who liveth and was dead. Now the JWs can understand Alpha and Omega. They can understand first and the last, referring to Jehovah, the Almighty God. But they will part company with us because they will not admit that Jesus was laying claim to being the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and also saying, I am he who liveth and was dead. But this is the word of God. But either accept it as is or not, but it will not change. We read, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Now we'll come to verse 19, a key verse. Somebody asking a question, somebody saying something? No? Okay. A key verse. Yes, yes, I was asking a question. If they will accept that he's the first and last, what is the problem with accepting that he's died and came back? Because of he Go again? If they will accept that he's the first and the last, yeah. what is the what is the problem with accepting that he came he is also died and came back? What's the problem with that? Yeah, why don't they accept that part too? Because if you're the first and last, you have to come because, and go. Because in their minds, Jesus is not God. So for example, if you look at St. John chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Their Bible, the New World Translation, inserts an A uh before God. So it reads, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was a God. Because they are not willing to admit that Jesus is, in fact, God. So what are they saying? My, there's more than, they're saying more, there's, there's a different God? There's more than one God? They are saying, you have God Almighty, the Father, and Jesus is a lesser God. Jesus is not God. Jesus is the, you, have, you have read about the archangel Michael, right? You read, in, you read about if you read Jude, you read about you, you, you reference to the archangel Michael. The JW believe that Jesus is the archangel Michael and not that. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. Good, good, yeah, man, no problem. So then, verse. 19 summarizes the book. The things which thou hast seen, and we just read through the things that he had seen, the Lord Jesus Christ in his, in his glory, shining um, um, like the sun in, in its strength, um, having a twitch sword proceeding out of his mouth, um, holding the seven stars, um, we see that no, these are the things which you have seen. The things which are, this is in chapters two and three, which we will come to later on, because these things that were written to the churches were things that were actually happen, happening in the churches, in those churches then. And the things which shall be hereafter. And those are the things that are referred to in chapters 4 to 22. All right? So he reveals the mystery. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which also is in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks with those stars are the seven churches. I'm going to read the, the angels of the seven churches. Another term that may be used for angels is messenger. All right? So the seven stars are the seven messengers or leaders in these seven churches. The, so the, the letters then were addressed primarily to the leadership in these churches concerning the things that were going on in these churches. Is that clear? Yeah. Good. So the seven stars represent the, the seven leaders, or the seven angels, and the seven candlesticks represent the seven churches. No, I gave some homework earlier. I said, and I asked that you read through chapters two and three, and identify the two churches that had no good report, the two churches that had good report, and the three churches that had good and bad about them. All right? So you're going to identify those. Secondly, as you read, you'll notice that for each of these churches, something different as far as identifying is concerned. Something different is said about the Lord Jesus Christ in being identified as the one who is writing the letter to the churches. And all of these things, these seven things, you can find in chapter one. So what you will do, hopefully, is identify what is said of the Lord Jesus Christ in him identifying himself to the seven churches. For example, in, 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 in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, this is looking ahead. We read, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. And immediately, you can look back, because we just read that, right? Um, in verse, verse 16 of chapter 1. He had in his right hand seven stars, all right? So you know readily that the letter to the Ephesians, Christ identified himself as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walk in the midst of the golden, seven golden candlesticks. So for each church, I know you have six more. <laughs> I did one for you. Um, each of them, Christ identifies himself using something that was said about him in chapter one to identify himself. So I'm asking that we, we do the homework, read up, Chapters 2 and 3 um, for next week and come prepared to, to discuss accordingly. All right. Any question, anybody? No question, nobody. One of two things. Either. <laughs> I'm not hearing that. Either they understood everything or they understood nothing. Either they understood everything or understood nothing. Understood. I understood. Understood. Or <laughs> I, I would normally ask my class, is it clear as mud? Um, oh, it is understood. Understood. Yes. So, so far, so far. So we, to, so we need to identify what he spoke to each church. Yeah, Something how we identified himself. How we identified himself to each church and also um, 
the, the churches that got good commendations, the churches that got poor commendations, and the churches that, that, that had a mixture of good and bad. So you have two of each of the first set and three of the other. All right? So we, we, we sign out here. Um, next week we might be a little bit longer. Um, I, I don't know. But we sign out here. And then and then we we move on to other other chapter or 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 what 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 I'm going to ask you to do to although it will come out you'll notice and you would have noticed already that there are a lot of sevens being mentioned a lot of sevens being mentioned um here in the book of revelation right and as i had said to the class last week when we speak of seven we basically speak of maturity full maturity or perfection or completion seven is a, um, the number that is used to represent perfection, full maturity, or completion. All right, so, so let us keep that in the back of our, our heads as we, as we go forward.